We are going to give you first a small lecture by God's grace on Dharma, the Dharma of the law, which is the duty of the law. I'm going to try to tell you why it is so important. The reason that it is so important, I will try to make known to you. And this will be a very important lecture from that standpoint. First of all, we have a material sense of duty or obligation to God. We who have elected or espoused to pursue this path, those who have not elected to espouse it or pursue it, those who are in the outer world, they have not yet come to any realization why they should. And therefore there is a distinction between them and between those who are on the path. This we must recognize. But we are not so much talking about the application to the world at large, to the whole world, as we are to the individual chila or student of the masters. Yet, in one sense, the masters are talking to the whole world. So the Dharma applies to the whole world whether or not they accept the obligation of the law. Now it is stated that Jesus Christ hung the law and the prophets on the cross. And the question has arisen in our mind as to whether or not God himself has abrogated the law. We are talking about a space in time before the cross as an era or an epoch and after the cross as an era and epoch. And whereas we will not in any way diminuate the mission of Jesus the Christ, we recognize him as the greatest of way showers to humanity. And we also recognize Gautama Buddha and the other great disciples of the Great White Brotherhood as being avatars also. And we recognize all men as being sons of God and all women as being daughters of God. We have excluded none. If we take the teachings of Jesus and examine those teachings very, very closely, what do we see? We see the acceptance of the law by man seems to bring him under a more than ordinary dispensation of the law. But in reality, this is an illusion. Because he always must find, and he always would find, that the law applies equally to all. So then we are of all people the most fortunate to have in our possession the stone of great price, the pearl of great price, the brilliant ruby, the diamond, and all of the jewels of the realm which are the various facets of the law. We are fortunate that we are garnished with understanding. An understanding, of course, that is relative. An understanding that is not complete. Yet that which we have is complete within itself. And we must not in any way seek to weaken the aspects of the law in ourselves. Most men have not for one minute thought that they were weakening the law when they actually were weakening the power of the law in their own lives. But the power of the law is here. It is the law of God. Because inherent in the universe are involuted precepts. And the involuted precepts become the evolutionary process when carried out in the natural order. It is utterly necessary that every one of you understand this. The more you understand of it through your heart, as well as your head, the more the obedience of the law will wrought in you the work of God. And therefore, the Dharma of the law will be a living law within yourselves. And only in this sense did Jesus Christ say he had hung the law and the prophets upon the cross. The abrogation of the law was the idea of man feeling in his own heart 
that thou shalt not kill, and therefore he would accept this as a mandate. And prior to committing this act, he would cut off the fruit of his action as far as the deed would be done. But he would never cut off within himself the causes. And as long as the causes remained extent in himself, so long, you see, could they at any moment blossom into action. And in this sense again, did he abrogate the law and the prophets by hanging them upon the cross, which is symbolic of the body of form. Because this is exactly how they worked. They worked in the realm of form because individuals had in their consciousness the idea that they were doing the work. They thought that Christ marched through the stations of the cross, as in Catholicism, in the sense that he did the work. Yet he was in all things perfect and unable at the same time to carry his cross to the hill of Golgotha. Simon the Cyrenian became the burden bearer of the cross of the master, which shows a form of limitation which did not actually exist in his consciousness, but which existed outwardly in the sense that the passions of the world were laid upon him. And so great were they, so great was the bag of darkness that was upon his back that he could not further complicate everything by carrying the cross. It was a world dharma for him which was too great to be carried by any one man. And in the sense that he was a son of God, of course he was a son of God. In the sense that he was the son of God, well, he was the son of God in the same sense that everyone is the son of God. And we do not diminuate his greatness by taking this from him. We enhance the greatness of every man by giving to him what is rightfully his own. By divine decree, by the intent of God and by the commandments of Christ. In this age, we have had innumerable people who have strayed from the path for this cause and because of this cause that they thought that the whole burden of their existence and experience rested upon the man Jesus the Christ. And they were so happy that he was at last willing to bear for them the stains of the world, which is the Dharma of the law. It is clearly the duty of the law that rested upon him to express this for every man. But so much so as we take it upon ourselves do we lighten the burden of the Lord of the world. And so much as do we shirk our responsibility, do we increase it. And this too becomes a karma-making apparatus, which we are often not aware of. Nor do we in any way do anything except to undermine ourselves by our weakening of our precepts. Most of us do not know the Dharma of the law. The Dharma of the law is very great. I have said it before and I repeat it. It is involuted in the universe. The machinations of it are involuted in us as people. The extent of it is to express it as people. And therefore, it is God that doeth the work. This then creates a non-person of us in a way. So that what are we, a bundle of nerves? A bundle of ideas gathered from the world thought? A bundle of concepts? What is our mind? What is the sitta, the mind of man? All of you may ask, what is it? It is the mind of God because there is one mind. And so soon as we disillusion ourselves of this terrible burden of our awesome responsibility as individuals and begin to realize that the responsibility is God's in man, God's in us, and that we are actually, in order to become fitted for the expression of God, being made to think like God in this realm of time, that we may become partakers in the realm of eternity, of that eternity, which is the foreverness of God. Extend in form, if you will, when he chooses it to be so. Otherwise, his responsibility may seem to dissipate in the personality of man. It seems to vanish away. We cannot find it. 
And therefore the Dharma of the law does not become relevant to us. We fail to express it because we do not realize it. Yet it is always there. And we miss the greatest boat of opportunity that has ever stood before us if we do. And we have no permanent guarantee that we as individuals will be counted worthy because upon the great potter's wheel, the imperfectly formed vessel may well become once again a lump of clay to be merged in the hands of the great potter and to be remolded or remade. But in the process, there is a destructivity of the personality of the individual who can realize. Because who can say that he is another? Who can actually claim to be another? Can anyone here say that he is someone else? He is himself precisely. And as himself precisely, insofar as he is concerned, he can lose his soul or be a castaway upon the potter's wheel. I do not think that God is overly concerned about this for the individual because what should he become concerned about? The impermanent or the real? God's concerns are for the real. And therefore, if man chooses to make a chimera out of his life, this becomes the garment he wears. And if he chooses the annihilation of self-destruction or the second death, certainly this eventually can be his. In the case of suicides, we have seen them returned again and again, like half-dead cats, to the stage of life, dumped back into the world to the precise experience level that they were in before, which caused them to commit the suicide, which was an action of their own dharma. Now then, they do not do anything whatsoever with their life, and back they go again. And this repeats itself, endless times it seems. But I can assure them the comfort of obvious oblivion or annihilation if they pursue that path. But the law is most merciful, and the law has granted men many opportunities to express the deity. I am not standing up here today and in any way impugning the dignity of any man, but I am exalting the dignity of every man. Because to exhibit to you today this great dharma, which is the wheel of the law, the wheel of the law, the wheel of duty, often trailing in the dust, often turning in the dust, but in reality exhibiting the magnificence of the creativity that fashioned time and eternity as varied aspects of himself and then gave to us in time, in the mud of time, the opportunity of becoming a god of creation. Some of you at this moment hardly see your own personal dharma as the means or the doorway to your attainment, but it is. It is a total attainment that you are weaving every day. It is not something that you cast aside lightly, for salvation does not come in the magic of certain sudden moments. I have watched many times and seen the expectancy on the faces of students that at the time the masters appear in our meetings and give a talk that they expect some thaumaturgical process or magical process to occur whereby they are absolved of all responsibility in the matter. Such does not make a God. A God must be made by making the right decisions. Otherwise he will not be able to properly love his children, the children of his own creation. And therefore, the masters do not actually deliver us in these means. They assist us. And every service is a moment of assistance on the way. It is a moment of divine delight. If we make it so, we ourselves become the arbiters of our destiny. And how great this is, how great this dharma is, we do not often know. Because we lack the vision to perceive it. Without vision, the people perish. But with vision, we not only can see the apocalyptic splendor, we can be the apocalyptic splendor. Here and now, in a moment of time, we capture, in the net of that time, a portion of eternity. So then, when the little man walking here on earth 
expresses some act of courtesy of grace, some act of kindness, some act of instruction in the law, some perfection of the higher dimensions, he is performing the dharma of his own duty. And therefore, he is capturing in the net of his own consciousness some of the sparkling realities of the day when he will sit upon a throne with me, as Jesus said, you shall sit with me in my Father's kingdom. To sit down there beside him, to sit at his feet, to have the consciousness of our own Holy Christ self fully expressed, to have our own presence fully awakened within us, is to receive the highest of directions. We have asked for the masters to give us directions, and they have. We have failed to listen at times, and then again we have listened. But the doorway of the greatest opportunity is always in our own presence, is always in our own dharma. This is one of the problems of individuality. It is latent within individuality. Do you understand me? I hope that you do. Because this is the process inherent within the great machine of being. It is apparent, but yet it is not apparent. It is seen, and it is not seen. And why? I will tell you. Because in this process, we are often captured by our false identity, all of us. We say, I do the work, and therefore I am a bad boy, or I am a good girl. It makes no difference. We say this. We think it, it is I that am bad or I that am good. And when Jesus said, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but God. He was proving this point to man. Because the I that doeth good or evil could not be God. Because we are speaking of dualities. And the I is then the consciousness the total consciousness of the personality in its full field of ramifications, its desires, it makes no difference what they are. It has these different desires and it expresses this. But this is not the God within. God within has only the manifestation of his own perfection. In a way, this stymies the forces of imperfection, you say, Ah, uh, yes, but the arbiter of it is still the personality because of the free will element inherent within that personality. And therefore, God is not allowed, this is what he meant when he said foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not a place to lay his head. You see, the element of free will in ourselves, which is actually the necessary quality we must have to become God, Otherwise, we could not be God because we would lack free will. This becomes the tender trap into which we fall so easily. Our free will. And foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests refers to the fact that this does not lodge in the human heart unless by the free will, by the design of the free will, by the intent of the free will, by the motive. And therefore, the motive becomes our salvation. It's our spare tire. It's our means of staying afloat if our motives be correct because the correct motive is the Dharma. And so the Dharma then must become reflected in ourselves. The universal Dharma needs to be reflected in ourselves. We need to welcome the Dharma as our savior and our best friend. It's the Dharma of the law. It's the son of the law. It's the son of God. It's the true Christ manifestation. And we must understand God and Christ as law and we must not seek to escape any burden of the responsibility of the law. This, of course, is what people did. This is what was done to it in the councils of Nicaea and of Trent, in the Christian doctrine. They removed from Christian doctrine all the elements of our great faith that came down originally through Christ. And they sought to create this great barrier, which Christ himself said was actually burned away by the great flash of lightning in the temple when he gave up the ghost. It says the veil in the temple was rent in twain. But now once again we have opaqued 
our relationship between God and ourselves. And this relationship must appear to us anew as the dharma, the duty, the responsibility of manifesting the qualities of God. Otherwise, we have a dead God, dead in ourselves. And we ourselves would be dead by it, not by its hand. We'd be dead by this thought of non-acceptance, of non-manifestation, of non-realization, of non-search. I do not think that you can take a sloth, a pig, and raise the pig suddenly to become a horse. I do not think in the evolutionary process that we can take an idiot and suddenly make him a god. I think it's ridiculous for us to suppose so. But certainly each embodiment should enhance our opportunity. Each embodiment should become something more productive of ourselves than the mere expression of the physical identity of eating and sleeping. We ought to do more than the ordinary men do because we know the dharma of the law, or else it itself becomes meaningless to us. And then God himself becomes meaningless because God is dead in us. But the law never dies. It moves on like a car of juggernaut. It is not ruthless toward man. The intent of God is not ruthless. It is precise. It sets a standard of perfection. And it gives us the possibility of realizing that perfection. And so each of us throughout our entire life should each day desire to step up just a little higher for ourselves than the day before. If we revert in the process momentarily, we can forgive one another and the Dharma of the law will forgive us. But the karma that we create will of course be our burden. But our total picture should be regarded not the picture of three days out of the year, but the picture of 365 days. It is what we do with time, because time is what matters to us, because it is the key to the doorway of eternity. Do you see that? And so this morning I have desired deeply to lecture upon this aspect of the law, because it is the means of man's attainment. There are quite a few men in the universe that have considered phenomena from the standpoint of attainment. They have thought because they could produce fire out of the air, or they could control the waters of the elements, or they could manifest their victory in various ways, which their fellow men could not do, that this exalted them above others and demonstrated or proved their mastery. It has an aspect of mastery because it is a process in man's development. It can quite well be applied to the great pianist, the great organist, the great singer, the great flutist, whoever we're talking about, whoever can play or in music, or whoever can express his precise understanding of the arts and the science. This is fine, this is beautiful, but it does not produce the art of the Dharma, of the soul, within, and therefore, this manifestation of God as duty is higher than all because it comes to the Erhat and the neophyte alike. The neophyte must obey and the Erhat must obey. And where do you escape from the law? Nowhere. Because the Dharma of the law is the perfection of the law. Its patterns are precise and perfect. And only the devil tells us, as they say in German, the Tufel, and in different languages, Diablo, and so forth, that this expression, the evil, the darkness, the shadow, the shame of ourselves, this tells us that we are incapable of expressing the great dharma of the law. I tell you, and I tell you truly, that every avatar, from the moment that time began until this present hour, has had the same opportunity we have. And they were all face to face with the same conditions of desire, they all existed for us all, you see, for them and for us, simultaneously as one. And of course we reinforced it. And this age has reinforced the strength of human desire even more so. The strength of man's inordinate desires today are greater than they ever were because more people are feeding that level of consciousness and the astral hordes are frightening to behold. All the more reason why we should recognize that the attainment of the law has come to many. And whether it comes to us or does not come to us is not a question of God's determination, but
but of ours. This has been released at a recent council of the great masters, that this should be communicated unto our students today because they recognize the import of it. And therefore the burden comes back to us and the words of the master come to us, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. The rest here is to rest in the Christ consciousness. The rest here is to rest in the Dharma of the law. Let the Dharma work in us. Let us become impersonally aware at first and then personally aware later of all the aspects of the law we do not now know. Every one of these are important. Let us take, for example, a case of kindness. I step forward. I express some kindness to some stranger. This is an expression of the Dharma, of the law. Now let's suppose that I express to this stranger some anger or irritation or harshness. Let's say that I exhibit harshness to the stranger. I may or I may not be exhibiting anger. Maybe my harshness is the result of my sense of the law, you see, my realization that he should avoid the karma that would come to him by his disobedience, and so I harshly rebuke him. At first, one may say that kindness is always to be expressed, that all harshness is a human quality. The great masters, in dealing with the personality of men, have not always felt so. They have recognized the need at times to use a wood rasp, as El Moria said one time, as I recall it, instead of a delicate file. We can take a small file and file on wood for hours. Very little dust comes off. We can take a big wood rasp in a short time, tremendous clouds of dust fill the air. I am very appreciative of these facts. And yet, a man by harshness does and can create karma in some cases. Because whatever he does must return to him. If then he is expressing a quality of God, whether in harshness or kindness, this is a different thing. But if he is expressing the quality of defending his personality by his harshness, this does not transfigure the motive. It clearly reveals the motive. The motive is a protection of the personality. We must then understand this aspect of the law and know that the eternal dharma involves stars, cosmic dust, planets, spiral nebulae, worlds without end turning in space, and the vitality of our own physical body. And if today the soul were to flee our physical body, we would find something had gone out, and therefore there is something within. And this is the animating process. The body itself is fearfully and wonderfully made, but this is not the real man. The real man exists in the mind, and truly the mind can grasp all of the principles of God. The capacity to grasp them all is within ourselves. If at first we don't succeed, try and try again. Little by little our strength grows. First, we move a mile, then two, and then ten, and then a hundred, and then a thousand, and then many thousand, and light years. And this is the way you gain strength is as your day is, so shall your strength be. May we all have a greater understanding of the Dharma of the law <coughs> as the involuted process of God working within ourselves. And may we learn the process so very easily of just surrendering ourselves to that aspect of the law and then letting the dictates of the law guide us step by step. This is the most potent manifestation of victory that a man can possibly have because it is God's victory. And we talk about God's victory, but do we actually understand what it means? It does not brook interference. It does not allow any interference with its plan when properly carried out. It is our destiny. Otherwise, it is our dust. Thank you.